everyone, and welcome to chapter 12. This is chapter 12 of part 1, dealing with the nervous system. Now, we know the nervous system is a very complex collection of nerves and specialized cells known as neurons that are going to transmit signals between different parts of the body. The, the, the nervous system is fundamental for our conscious experience, personality, as well as behavior. So it's the study of the nervous system is called neurobiology and it combines the behavioral and life sciences. Now there are two organ systems that are dedicated to maintaining the internal condition um, coordination. That's the endocrine system and the nervous system. The nervous system deals with communications by means of chemical messengers such as hormones that are going to be secreted into the blood. The nervous system they deal with the electrical and the chemical means to send messages from cell to cell. Now the nervous system um, it carries out its coordinating tasks in three basic steps. The first step now through sense organs and sensory nerve endings, it receives information about the body and the external environment and transmits messages to the spinal cord as well as the brain. Number two, the spinal cord and the brain, they're going to process this information and then relate it to past experiences and determine an appropriate response. And number three, the spinal cord and the brain, they're going to issue commands to muscle and gland cells to carry out the response. So for the first one, you're going to have a detection. You're going to receive the information. For example, if it's cold outside, what's going to happen? Your body is going to sense, you have various receptors that are going to sense that, that the external environment is cold. That information is then transmitted or sent to the spinal cord to be processed. The spinal, the spinal cord and the brain are going to decide, hey, are we going, what are we going to do? This person is getting cold. Various organs are going to shut down if we don't um, respond correctly. So what are we going to do? Then when the brain makes up that decision, then it sends the information back to the muscles and the glands to carry out the response. So what, what are the muscles going to do? What are the, what are the blood, blood vessels going to do? Blood vessels are going to vasoconstrict and um, you'll have uh, piloerector muscles that are going to cause the hair on your arms to stand and, and of course goosebumps. So that would be the response. Now the nervous system has two major anatomical subdivisions. They are the nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The nervous system, what are we going to deal with? The brain and the spinal cord. Okay? And those are enclosed and protected by the cranium and the vertebral column. The peripheral nervous system now, they consist of all of the nerve system except the brain and the spinal cord. So that's everything in outside here, running along the extremities and of course our little ganglia here as well. Now the nerve, that is considered to be a bundle of nerve fibers or, ax or axons wrapped in connective tissue. A ganglion, which is what we find here, is a knot-like swelling in the nerve where the cell bodies of neurons are concentrated. So ganglia, ganglion is the singular form and ganglia is the plural form. Now when we look at the subdivision as a whole for the nervous system, we're going to say the two main divisions are the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system, the CNS, deals with what? The brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system deals with the sensory and motor divisions. Those are the two main subdivisions of the peripheral nervous system. The sensory division is divided into visceral sensory division and the somatic um, sensory division. The motor division, what do you think they're div um, divided into? The visceral motor division and the somatic motor division. 
Now the Vischer motor division is divided even further. And we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. You may have heard about these before. We'll get into that a little, just a little bit later. So the peripheral nervous system, which is one we're going to deal with just for a little bit, we're dealing with their two um, functional, major functional subdivisions. I already said we're dealing with the sensory and the motor. So with the sensory afferent, sensory or afferent division, they're going to carry the sensory signals from various receptors to the um, to the CNS. So they're carrying. Um, that information from the cold wire, which will be your thermal receptors, they're going to carry that information to the CNS. Um, that information will inform the CNS of the stimuli within and around the body. So it's going to tell you what's going on outside the body as well as inside of the body. Now, as we saw in the in the previous slide, the sensory division is divided into the somatic sensory and the motor sensory division sorry in the yeah in the visceral sensory division I'm sorry so the somatic it carries signals from the receptors to the receptors in the skin muscles bones and joints so for instance if it's cold outside we're dealing with the somatic sensory division if you tore a muscle somatic for bones if there's a fracture if there um a dislocation we're dealing with somatic sensory division now the visceral sensory division it carries signals from the viscera of the thoracic and the abdominal cavities we're looking at organs that are involved in the thoracic and the abdominal cavities so what type of organs are we looking at the heart the lungs the stomach um, the pancreas kidneys um gallbladder liver those are the the cav those are the organs that you'll find within the abdominal cavity as well as the thoracic cavity. Our second major subdivision of the um oh, I'm sorry of the peripheral nervous system is the motor or efferent division. And this carries signals from the CNS to gland and muscle cells that carry out the body's response. So it's going to take that information that was sent to the um, to the central nervous system and send it to the gland and the gland is either going to secrete a particular hormone, um, increase the, the secretion of a particular hormone or decrease it. The muscle cells are either going to contract or, or relax. Okay? And we have effectors that respond to the commands to help the process um, to follow through. Now we have two divisions as you mentioned earlier. We have the somatic nervous, the, the somatic motor division and the um, visceral motor division. So the somatic motor division they carry out signals to um, the skeletal muscle. Okay and the output produces muscular tr contractions as well as um, somatic reflexes and they're going to involve um, involuntary muscle contractions and those are called somatic reflexes when we deal with the visceral motor division that carries signals to the glands the cardiac muscle the smooth muscle over which we have no voluntary control. And those responses are called visceral, visceral reflexes. Now the autonomic nervous system, also the visceral, mo visceral motor division, um, they have two further divisions, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic division, it tends to arouse the body for action. For example, through um, accelerating of the heartbeat and increasing respiratory airflow and of course you're going to inhibit um, digestion so if you're being chased by something or someone what happens your, your heart rate's going to increase your breathing's going to increase and at the same time where you have an increased blood flow to the to the various muscles that are needed to help you run 
you're going to have a decrease of blood flow to the digestive and the urinary system. Why? Because you don't need it at that point in time. You don't need, your food doesn't need to be digested. You're, you're too busy running away. Then we have the parasympathetic, which is the opposite, which is that common effect. So this picture, you have um, reached to a safe, a safe hiding spot or safe space or even back at your house. And um, you're in that calming effect. So your heart rate has decreased as well as your breathing. Of course, you're thirsty, a little bit hungry. So what? You're going to have an increase of blood flow to your digestive system and maybe your urinary system. But everything is in that common state. So sympathetic deals with that fight or flight, or arousing of the body for action. And the parasympathetic deals with the common effect. All right, now, now the cells or neurons, they have three fundamental physiological properties that enable them to communicate with other cells. We have ex excitab excitability, also called irritability. Number two, conductivity. And number three, um, secretion. When you do with excitability, all cells are excitable. So that means that they're going to respond to a stimuli. The neurons have developed this this property to the highest, highest degree. When you do it, number two, conductivity. Neurons respond to stimuli by, by producing electrical, um, electrical signals that are conducted to other cells. And number three, secretion. Um, when electrical signals reaches the end of a nerve fiber, the neuron secretes a neurotransmitter. That's going to stimulate the next cell. Now, neurons fall into three fundamental classes based on the three major aspects of the, of the nerve, of nervous system function. We have the sensory or afferent neurons, we have the interneurons, and then we have the motor or efferent neurons. So let's look at the sensory neurons. It seems to get the information is being repeated, but Repetition is not a problem. I help you with remembering. Now, with the sensory neurons, trans you have a transmission of information. Um, sorry, you have stimuli that is uh, that is detected by the various receptors within within a particular area. It could be within the skin, within an organ. But you have receptors that are going to be that are going to detect this the stimuli, and then send it to the to the CNS. Now, this information is transmitted, and it begins in almost every organ of the body, and then it ends right here in the CNS. So you see, this is the ending part. And afferent means um, conducting signals toward the the CNS. When we look at the interneurons, these interneurons, they're going to be found inside of the CNS. And they receive signals from many other neurons and carry out integrative functions and the make decision um, about the response. And about 90% of the neurons in the body are interneurons. 90% of the neurons in the human body are interneurons. The word interneuron refers to the fact that they lie between and interconnect the incoming sensory pathways and the outgoing motor pathways of the CNS. Now the motor or the afferent neuron, um, they send signals predominantly to um, to cells, to muscle cells and gland cells. Those are the effectors. Now they are called motor neurons because most of them lead to the muscle cells and the efferent because they carry signals away from the CNS. So this is your A, this is your, this is your S, your sensory, also called the afferent. This is your I, also called association neurons, and this is your your M, 
So to help you remember the three fundamental classes, you can use SIM, S-I-M, sensory, into neurons, and motor, and that is the order. You're not going to have motor, then sensory, then into neurons. No, that's completely incorrect. Remember that order. Now let's take a look at the, the neuron itself. We have the soma. What is the soma? Well, the soma is considered is uh, the control center. It's also called the neurosoma, the cell or the cell body. Now it has, it contains a single centrally located nucleus, which you see here. Here's our, our soma, and it contains a nucleus with a very large um, nucleolus, which you see right there inside of it. Now, the cytoplasm contains mitochondria, lysosomes, um, Golgi, apparatus, Golgi apparatus or Golgi complex, and many inclusions, and an extensive um, rough ER or rough endoplasmic reticulum and cytoplasm, cytoskeleton. Now, the cytoskeleton consists of a dense mesh of um, microtubules and neurofilic um, fibrils that, um, that are compartmentalized that compartmentalize sorry, the rough ER into dark staining um, nasal bodies. See that move that. All right. So mature neurons, they do not divide, but they have long lives. Now, stem cells in the CNS, however, they can divide and develop into new neurons. The major cytoplasmic um, plasma inclusions are um, glycogen, glycogen um, granules, we have lipid droplets, um, melanin, and a golden brown pigment called lipo, lipofuscin. Now lipofuscin is produced when um, those lysos lysosomes start to digest uh, worn out organelles. So when these organelles are, are a little bit aged, <laughs> have a little bit of age on them, the lysosomes, um, the, the lyco fusions, sorry, they start to, they are produced when the lysosomes start to digest these old looking organelles. Now the lipofusions also accumulate with age and they, and pushes the nucleus to one side of the cells. So the granules of the lipofusions are called worn and tear, wear and tear granules. Now the, the soma gives rise to these the very thick, um, these very thick branches here, and they're called um, dendrites. They look like tree branches that are like extending off the root, or they may look like the root of a tree. But these little extensions off the soma are called dendrites. Now there are a number of them. Um, and they vary from thousands depending on the neuron and they're usually as tangled as, mul as multiple um, dendrites may seem they provide highly precise pathways and they are those pathways for reception as well as processing of neural information Then we have our axon running along here. Now the axon, it originates on the mound on a soma called the axon helix. So here's our axon helix. And our axon um, originates from there. So it says that long extension going all the way down. Now the axon is um, cylindrical and relatively unbranched for most of its length, although it may give rise to to axon um, collateral, which you see this branch here, along the way. So along the way, depending on the type of, um, okay, so let me um, continue to look at the axons. Um, most axons, they branch off ex extensively at their distal end. So at this particular end, you're going to see them branching off here, okay? Now an axon is specialized for rapid conduction of nerve sim of nerve signals to points remote from the 
from the soma. Okay, so it's cytoplasm of the cytoplasm of the axon is the um, axon axon plasma, and its membrane is the um, axolemma. Now, a ne a neuron never has more than one axon, and some have none. Now, it's swan cells. Now, they have swan cells and have myelin sheaths that are associated with the axon. Okay. Now, somas, they're going to range from uh, 5 to 130 micrometers in, di in diameter, while the axons, they're going to range from approximately 120 um, sorry, let me go back. 220 uh, micrometers, and from a few millimeters to more than a meter in length. Now, at the distal end down here um, of an axon, it usually has a terminal um, aberration of fine, fine, fine um, branches. Now, each branch ends in a synaptic knob. Okay, so all these little knobs that you see at the end of the branch. And then that forms a junction or synapse with the next cell. Now the synapse contains synaptic vesicles uh, full of um, neurotransmitters. Now in the autonomic neurons, in autonomic neurons the axons has numerous beads called um, varsic um, varsicosities. Now the axon, the, the neuron structure varies and they are classified according to the number of processes extending from the stroma. We have a multipolar neuron and with that multipolar, <laughs> multi, multipolar neuron, um, those neurons are those with one axon, you see here, one axon and multiple dendrites and they are the most common type of neuron. The bipolar neuron, they have one axon and one dendrite. Now those are the ones you might find um, in the inner air, um, as well as in the retina or the olfactory cells. Then we have the unipolar. And they only have a single process leading away from the soma and they are uh, represented by the nucleus that carry signals or sensory signals to the spinal cord now since it's only a short distance away from the soma uh, the process branches, they look like a T uh, with a perpendicular fiber bringing signals from a source of sensory and a central fiber continuing into the spinal cord. Now the an anaxonic neuron, they have multiple dendrites but no axon. So they're going to communicate through their dendrites and do not produce action potentials. And some are found in the brain, the retina, as well as the adrenal medulla. Alright, so many proteins are made in the soma. They must be transported to the axon and the axon terminal. And they're there to repair the axolemma, and they serve as gated ion pro, um, channel proteins, as um, enzymes, or as neurotransmitters. The axonal transport refers to the passage of proteins, organelles, and other materials along an axon to and from the cell soma. Now, movement away from the soma, down the axon, t is called. Um, anterior grade transport. So that's coming from um, 
from the soma down the axon. That's called our, our, an, our anterior grade transport. And then our retrograde transport is movement up the axon toward the um, toward the soma. Now, materials, they travel along microtubules of the cytoskeleton. Now, we do have a little uh, motor protein for the retrograde transport, and it's called the um, kinesin. Now, the protein, the motor protein for the retrograde is called the dynin. And they act somewhat like a uh, myosin head of muscle, of the heads of the muscle, and they crawl along these uh, microtubules. Now, there are two types of axonal transport, and they are fast and slow. The fast axonal transport um, occurs at a rate of 20 to 400 milli millimeters per day and may be um, anterior grade or retrograde. For the fast anterior grade, it transports mitochondria, synaptic vessels, other organelles, axillama components, um, 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 calcium ions, um, enzymes, and they carry those things towards the distal end of the axon. So that's all the way down here to the end, from the soma all the way down to the end. The fast retrograde, so that's returning from the axon all the way to the soma, there it returns, um, their transport returns, it uses the synaptic vessels, vesicle, sorry, to the soma and informs the soma of any ch conditions at the terminals. So if there's any type of malfunctioning going on here at the axon terminals, that information is sent back to the soma. Now some pathogens, such as tetanus toxin or um, certain viruses, um, they're going inv to they invade the nervous system by entering the distal tips of the ex of the axons, and begin trans and begin transport ported to the uh, soma by the fast retrograde transport. Now we have the slow axonal transport, also called the um, the exoplasmic flow, and that occurs at a rate of zero point five to ten millimeters per day and is always an, um, anterior grade. Now the slow axonal transport, it moves enzymes and cytoplasmic, sorry, cytoskeleton component, components uh, down the axons. It renews worn out um, axoplasmic components in the mature neurons. And then it also supplies these new axoplasm for developing or the regeneration, regenerating of the neurons. Now, if there are damaged nerve, set, nerve fibers, they are re regenerated at a speed um, governed by the slow axonal transport. Now, neurons, they're outnumbered by, by as much as 50 to 100 by, by supported cells called neuraglia or glia cells. Now, glia means glue, and one of the roles of these cells is to bind neurons and form a supportive framework. Let's move on. Alright, so we're going to take a look at the different types of cells. We have astrocyte, we have um, oligodendrite, then we have our um, ependymal, ependymal cells, and we have our micro, microglia. All right, so look at look at the four types of um, neuroglia that we have. The first one is olo, oligodendrocytes. Now they're somewhat resemble. They look like an octopus. We saw which one they look like right here in the middle here. Okay. So it looks like a, like an octopus with as many as 15 arm-like processes. Now each process, they're going to spindle around the nerve fiber, just like an, like an electrical tape. It's going to wrap around the fiber uh, with the insulating 
a myelin sheath. So it's going to have a myelin sheath within to help insulate it. Now this sheath, it speeds up the nerve conduction. Then we have the ependymal cells. They resemble um, cuboidal. Here we have them right here, down here. They look at cuboidal epithelial lining, the internal cavities of the brain, as well as the spinal cord. So remember, we, I hope you guys remember from last semester, from 201, where we talked about cuboidal and columnar, talking about the shape of the cell. So this one is cuboidal epithelium. Now, however, they have no basement membrane and have no root-like processes that are going to penetrate the underlying tissues. Now, these cells, they produce um, CSF, which is a cerebral spinal fluid, which are going to bathe and, and, and lubricate the CNS and, and fill into the internal cavities. Now, these cells have cilia, and they help to, cir um, to circulate this CSF. The micro, microglia, which is our third one, these are small uh, microphages that develop from white blood cells called monocytes. So here is our um, microglia. Now they wander through the CNS constantly probing for cellular debris or other problems. So these are like the, the the generals or the guards of the of the CNS to make sure nothing is is getting defective. Those are our microglia. They are thought to perform a complete backup on the brain tissue several times a day, phagotizing um, dead cells. That means engulfing them and getting rid of them. Um, dead tissue as well as um, micro microorganisms, things that don't belong there. They're going to engulf it and get rid of them. Okay, they become concentrated in areas damaged by infection, trauma, or stroke, and um, pathologists look for clusters in the brain tissue as a clue for any type of injury. So if you see them clustered together, there is definitely something occurring within that particular area of the brain. Okay. Then our last one is the astrocytes. Astrocytes are the most um, abundant glia, and they constitute over 90% of the tissue in some of the brain area. They are named for their many branch star-like shapes. They have most diverse functions of the, of the glia. They form a supportive um, framework for uh, the nervous system. They have extensions called perivascular feet okay. um, that contact the blood vessels and then they stimulate them to form a tight seal called the blood brain barrier. So here are our, our um, astrocytes and you see the little um, peri perivascular uh, feet that are attached to the blood vessels. Okay. They also monitor neural activity and they signal blood vessels to constrict or, or dilate to regulate blood flow, uh, provided oxygen and nutrient supply in accordance to, in accordance to um, the neural demand. They uh, convert blood glucose to lactate and supply it to the neurons. They also secrete um, nerve growth factors, proteins that promote neuro, neuron growth and synapse formation. They communicate electrical I, they communicate electrically with neurons and may influence signaling. They also um, regulate the the um, the chemical composition of the tissue fluid, absorbing neurotransmitters and potassium ions, so they do not reach excessive levels. And they form hardening scar tissue when neurons are damaged, and and that process is called astrocytosis or sclerosis. Now we have these things called Swan, Schwann cells, and there are only two types that are found within um, the P and S, the peripheral nervous systems. Now the Swan cells, 
is the swan cell, sorry, and the satellite cells. The swan cells, they're the ones that they're going to envelope the uh, the nerve fibers of the PNS, and they um they wind repeatedly around a nerve fiber, and they're going to produce on uh, the myelin sheath similar to the one produced by the oleodendrocytes in the CNS. Now the swan cells they're also they also assist in the regeneration of any damaged fibers. The satellite cells now they're going to surround the uh, the uh, the neurosoma or the soma in the ganglia of the PNS, and they provide electrical insulation around the soma, and they regulate the chemical environment. So we have this the satellite cells that are surrounding the soma while the swan cells uh, surround the um, the nerve fibers and these two are the only ones that you'll find in the P N S. Now when we look at tumors, tumors are masses of rapidly growing or rapidly dividing cells. Um, mature neurons that have little or no capacity for mitosis and seldom form any type of tumors. Now tumors, they arise from um, meninges, which is uh, that protective labor layer of the CNS, um, metastasis, m metastasis <laughs> Uh, from none, uh, ouch, from none, neuro, neuro, neuronal tiber, fat, sorry, tumors in the, in the other organs, as well as they oft, often ganglia cells that are, that are, um, mitotically active throughout life. Now, gli gliomas, they glow, they grow rapidly and are highly malignant. And these blood-brain barriers, they decrease the effectiveness, the effectiveness of chemotherapy. And of course, treatment consists of radiation or um, or surgery. Now, when we look at the myelin sheath, it's an insulating layer around the nerve fiber, somewhat like a rubber um, insulating a wire. Now, because the myelin sheath or the myelin is a is a plasma membrane of the glian cells, its composition is is like that of the membrane, with about twenty percent protein and twenty percent mixed lipids. Now, the production of the myelin sheath is called myelination. Then it begins in the in the fourth week of fetal development. In the fourteenth, sorry, week of fetal development. And it it proceeds rapidly in infancy, and isn't completely and isn't completed until late adolescence. Now, children under the age of two may not be put on a low-fat diet because this could interfere with the myelination. Now, in the PNS, the swan cells uh, they spiral. The swan cell spirals rapidly um, around a single nerve fiber. And they're going to lay down as many as a hundred compact layers of its membrane with only no cytoplasm. The swan cells, they spirals outward, finally, um, finding, finally ending with a thick outmost coil called the um, neurilema, and that which consists of a body of, of swan cell with its nucleus and most of its cytoplasm. Now the external to the to the to the um, neurolemma is called a, is a basal uh, lamina, and then a thin sleeve of fibrous connective tissue called the endo endoneurium. So let's take a look at it right here. Here we have the um, the nerve fiber, and of course covering the nerve fiber we have the axolemma. Then we have the um, the neurolemma. What do we say the neurolemma is? It's that thick outermost coil. Okay. 
and it contains these swan cells with a nucleus and this consists of your myelin sheath So here is that little process I was referring to as to what happens when you have this myelin sheath. I mean, not the myelin sheath, sorry, the swan cell. So here's your axon again. Here's another diagram of what we're talking about. Here is your axon. And around the axon, you have this swan cell that's going to spiral around it. When it finally spirals, you know you have the, the nucleus that is embedded within this swan cells as it keeps spiraling around we have that, ex that external portion um, to the neurolemma which is the basal lemma here's that basal lemma here in that light purplish area okay and then on top of that we have a very thin thin sheath of fibrous connective tissue called the endoneurium okay Now in the CNS, each um, oligodendrite, they're going to reach out to myelinate several nerve fibers in its immediate vicinity. Because it is anchored in multiple nerve fibers, two multiple nerve fibers, it cannot migrate around them. So it pushes newer layers of myelin under the old ones. Myelination spirals inward toward the nerve fiber. The nerve fibers of the CNS has no um, neurolemma or no endoneurium. So that outer sheath that was covering, it, it's not there. That was covering the basal lemma, lamina or the basal lamina is not going to be there, that outer sheath. Okay? Now many swan cells or the oligodendrons are needed to cover um, one nerve fiber. Now each sheath is segmented into different parts. We have the nodes of, of Ranvier, we have the internodes, and then we have the um, initial segment and we have the, the, um, the trigger zone. Now, the nodes of Rembrier, those are the gaps that you're going to find right in here. Those gaps that you're going to find between the segments. The interneurons, sorry, the, in, the internodes, sorry, that's that myelin covered segments from one gap to the next. The initial segment, oops, let me go back, sorry. The initial segment, that's that short segment of nerve fiber between the the axon helix and the first ganglia so that small little segment seg section right here that's the initial segment because this section here is the axon um the axon helix and then our trigger zone that is the axon helix plus the seg the segment section so from here the very first from the tip of the very first ganglia to the beginning of the axon helix, this is considered to be the trigger zone. So that's the axon helix plus the initial segment gives us our trigger zone. Okay, let's skip over to the next page. Um, so let's talk about the diseases of the myelin sheath. Now, we have a disorder called multiple sclerosis. Everybody has heard of that. And it deals with when the, the, the oligendrocytes and the, myelin, and the myelin sheath are deteriorating. And those are the ones that are deteriorating in the CNS. The myelin is then replaced by hardened scar tissue. The nerve conduction is disrupted. And that's where you have double vision, the person starts to tremor, and the speech is also de um, defective. Now, you, most people get an onset between the ages of 20 to 40, and um, usually are fatal from ages 25 to 30 years 
after being diagnosed. If you're diagnosed with it now and then, it may become a little bit fa fatal 20 to 25 to 30 years from now. Of course, it may be caused by an autoimmune triggered by um, a virus. Then we have tex, te, um, te sex disease. which is a hereditary disorder of infants of Eastern Europe uh, Jewish um, ancestry. And it's an abnormal accumulation of um, glycolipid called the GM2 in the myelin sheet. And it causes blindness, loss of coordination, and as well as um, dementia. Now, when it is accumulated, when that GM is accumulated, it causes a disruption in the nerve cells or the nerve cells. All right, and if a person um, obtains this particular disease before the age of four, it can be extremely fatal for that particular individual. All right, so let's look at these unmyelinated nerve fibers. Now, many nerve fibers in the CNS and the PNS are unmyelinated, but in the PNS, even unmyelinated fibers are enveloped by the swan cells. Yeah, them right here. Sorry, not the outer part, the ones in the inside. Now, um, one small one swan cell is going to harbor at least 1 to 12 small unmyelinated fibers. So here we have these unmyelinated fibers right in here. They are surrounded by the swan cells. Now the swan cells, the, the their plasma membrane it doesn't spiral around the fiber, but it folds once and somewhat overlaps the edges of the fibers. Okay? Now this wrapping is the uh, neurolemma, also called the the max the max the mass axon in the unmyelinated fibers. Now, most nerve fibers, fibers have individual channels, but small fibers are sometimes bundled. Now, a basal lemma, which is what we have, let me see if I can get this going here, the basal, the basal um, lamina, which we have on the outside, it surrounds the swan cell and the fibers. So here are the swan cell, and here are our basal um, lamina, and there are unmyelinated nerve fibers. Now the speed at which nerve, fibre, nerve signals are conducted along a nerve fiber depends on the diameter and the presence of the absence of myelinin. Now the signal conduction occurs along the surface of a fiber not in the, ax uh, not in the axon plasma. So it's on the outside, not on the inside, is where we have the signal conductions. Now, large fibers, they have more surface area and conductions um, signals are more rapidly than, than um, the small ones. A mile and further speeds um, signal conduction. Now, um, when we look at the nerve signals, they travel about 0 0.5 to 2.0 um, meters per second in small unmyelinated fibers and 3 to 50 meters per second in myelinated fibers of the same size. Now in, on, in large myelinated fibers, um, nerve signals, they're going to travel as fast as 120 meters per second. And we have these slow on myelinated fibers. Those are sufficient for many purposes, such as pupil dilation and um, supplying the stomach. Now, the fast myelinated uh, fibers they occur where speed is vital, such as in motor commands to the skeletal muscle. Those are good for signals for balance and vision. Now, nerve uh, fibers of the PNS are, are very vulnerable to, to, uh, to trauma. So remember, we're talking about the PNS. These are talking about 
these nerve fibers on the extremities, or even the fingers, the legs. So they're more vulnerable to any type of trauma, and um, but may regenerate, but may regenerate of its soma is in, but may regenerate if its soma is intact, and at least some neurolemma remains. So I'm gonna move all the way down to let's go to a, a slide. This is just talking about the process of, of how the um the nerve fibers regenerate. So I'm gonna go to this particular diagram here. Okay. This diagram is showing you the very first one that talks about the a normal nerve fiber, exactly what it looks like. It has a, a an intact endoneurium, um, myelin sheath, and here we have the muscle fiber. And we have the neuromuscular conjunction, or the, not conjunction, I'm sorry, the neuromuscular junction. So what's going to happen when there is some type of trauma? We're going to go through the various steps. Now, pretend that the fiber is severed or the, the nerve fiber is cut. Now, what happens at the distal end um, to the injury, it cannot survive because it cannot snap. So this part cannot synapse this is the distal end of the fiber it cannot synapse properly so this the terminal is going to be um, is going to start to degenerate because information is not being transmitted to the muscle so we're going to have a protein synthesis um, organelles are limited to the soma we have the swan cells of the distal fiber also start to degenerate which I just mentioned you see this get this mouse moving also starts to degenerate and we have our macrophages that clean up tissue debris at the point of the injury so we're gonna have these little um, macrophages that are gonna come out and start cleaning up um, the mess so we call these the maids <laughs> these are the macrophages okay and then the third one what happens here you notice there's a different a change in the soma itself so the soma is going to start to, to increase in size, it's going to swell, and the endoplasmic reticulum it starts to break up. So the nasal bodies, they start to disperse. So we're, it's going through um, um, some type of abnormality, abnormality, the soma. The nucleus is not centered anymore, so it's going to move off to the side. And some neurons they start to die at this particular stage. Now the axon stump it may uh, sprout multiple growths, which we see here we have multiple growths crossing while the distal end starts to or continues to degenerate. Okay, so what else is happening at at this particular stage? Um, the muscle fibers they're going to start to deprive, going to be deprived of any type of nerve supply and then start to shrink. So you see that the nerve the, the muscle fibers are shrinking because they're not getting any type of electrical stimulation to them. And this is called that process is called um, denervation atrophy. Denervation atrophy. Okay? So here we are now on step four. Now near the injury now, we're gonna have these swan cells the basal lemma and the uh, neural lemma, they start to form a particular tube, a regeneration tube. The swan cells are going to produce um, cell adhesive molecules and nerve growth factors that are going to um, enable the, the nerve to regrow. Now when one axon growth process uh, finds its way into the tube, it grows very very rapidly about three to five millimeters per day that's pretty fast now the regeneration of this tube is going to guide the growth sprout the growing sprout back to the original you see how how the um, tube is 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 guiding the these sprouts that had that had um, start to um, grow out we saw here in step three it's going to guide it back um, to the original target cells, re-establishing the synaptic com um, contact. So we're going right back into the to the um, to the axon, so they can get signals to the the muscle. 
So here it is in this particular phase here. We're on step five. I'm sorry. Step five, here we have it grown back in and it's starting to um, get or grow or continue its growth process to the, the muscle itself. Now when contact is established, so when these particular um, these sprouts have, re have been rerouted and is going towards the and have made contact with the, the muscle cells, we notice what happened over here. The soma shrank, went back to its original size and appearance. And we have the, the re-innovation of muscle growth. So um, the regeneration of the muscle fiber. Here we have the um, denervation atrophy. This is a muscle due to loss of nerve contact by a damaged nerve. So this is what happens to the the muscle cells, the muscle tissue, when there's when there's damage to the um, to the muscle. When you start when there's damage to the cell itself. So the whole process we we're talking about when you saw in step uh, three, four, and five we have atrophy of the muscle this is what it would actually look like okay all right so we have um, nerve growth factor we look at um, nerve growth factor it's a protein secreted by a gland muscle and and glial cells and is picked up by the axon terminals of the axon it, pre it um, prevents the programmed cell de death in growing neurons and it also enables growing neurons to make contact with their target cells. And it was illustrated by Rita uh, Levi Monticelli, Monta Montel Montelseni, sorry, back in the 1950s. And um, she won a Nobel Peace a Nobel Peace Prize with Stanley Collin in 1986, and they use fact growth factors. Um, the use of growth factors is now a vibrant field of research. We have some other individuals. We have Galen. We have um, Renee. Um, this uh, Renee. We have. Um, Lugi and Camillo. These names are very difficult to pronounce, so please forgive me. Now, the very first individual, Galen, he thought that the brain pumped a vapor called um, psychic um, pneuma through um, hollow, hollow nerves and squirted into the muscles to make them contract. Now, that's very interesting, but at least he had an idea of what, of, <laughs> of how something, at least how the brain would have worked. It was incorrect, but it, it was an idea. Then we have Rene in the, in the 17th century um, supported this individual's theory. Then um, Galvani, he discovered the role of electricity and muscle contraction in the 18th century. And then by the 19th century, we had um, Golgi, Camillo Golgi, um, who developed an important method for staining neurons with silver. Our last individual here is Santiago um, Roman E. Cal Cajal, I'm sorry, <laughs> set forth the neuron doctrine of nerve pathways is not a continuous wire or tube, but a series of cells separated by gaps called snaps. Now, uh, there are two key issues in neurophysiology, uh, and they are how does a neuron generate an electrical signal, and how does it transmit a meaningful message to the next cell? So, oh, I'm sorry. So, this is the end of our chapter, our chapter um, 12, uh, part 1. Please uh, go over the video. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to post on Blackboard.
in the in um, the question and answer area and put chapter 12 part 1 if you have any questions pertaining to this section okay now when you have time this week please go ahead and watch chapter 12 part 2 okay